Hi, my name's Elizabeth. I am an aquarist at the Greensboro Science Center, and I primarily work with our jellyfish. So jellyfish propagation, all things that sting you. And I'm Katie Venya. I am the Signathid Aquarist at the Greensboro Science Center. So I work with all of our seahorses, our cold water stuff, and the lead on the ray training team. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to the Raw Safari Podcast. So y'all, um, you know, we have been spending a lot of time between last season and the start of this one at the Greensboro Science Center. And frankly, that's been because there's so much cool stuff happening there right now and so many amazing people that we get to spend time with. But so far, all of our time spent there has been at the zoo. But it turns out that Greensboro actually has an incredible aquarium as part of the overall science center there. And so today, we are stepping away from the zoo, but uh, heading to the aquarium to bring you my interview with Elizabeth Hinker and Katie Benya, who are both people that work at the aquarium and are going to be talking about some really cool, really unique topics, y'all. We are talking about jelly propagation, about seahorses, we're talking about training with rays and eels, all kinds of cool stuff. We get into some octopus stuff a little bit. Um, there's a whole lot of kind of... I don't know, lesser charismatic, if you don't know them, less popular, whatever animals. Although I got to tell you, I think they're all really incredible. And uh, th this conversation, it definitely goes to places that our podcast hasn't really gone to before, which is always exciting for me. So uh, I hope it's exciting for you as well. So yeah, if you're sitting here and you're hearing this intro and your first thought was, oh, we're back at Greensboro. Okay, I like it there, but we've been there a lot. This is like, it's like a whole different facility. Uh, it's 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 really cool that there is both an aquarium and a zoo at one place and that they are, you know, intertwined and they, they know each other and stuff. But at the same time, um, they're very different parts of the same facility. And I'm excited to share that difference with you all today and all these cool little stories. Um, so Elizabeth and Katie are awesome and we're going to get to them in a moment. But first, let me remind you to make sure that you hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes of the pod. Make sure that you have left a rating or a review or both anywhere that you can do that, anywhere that you listen. Five stars is what we aim for. Uh, you know how that works. And then don't forget that you can support the pod for as little as three dollars a month by going to patreon.com slash raw safari and you know follow along on instagram and all those lovely social media places at raw safari and at tiktok uh at raw safari pod so yeah all those things and without further ado let's get to my interview with elizabeth hinker and katie benya of the greensboro science center <laughs> You just said a word that I don't know, and when we were hanging out before this interview, you said so many words that I don't know, so I'm really looking forward to being educated on words that I don't <clears throat> know, um, but I'm really, I'm really excited about this. So um, when I first connected with, with Greensboro, um, my excitement about this place has always been on the terrestrial side mm -hmm. uh, because red pandas and binturongs and such, but I love me an aquarium, and I think it's so cool that this facility has, has both, mm -hmm. as well as some other sciencey stuff that, you know, is, is also cool, but, but we're focused on the animal stuff here. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited uh, for y'all to pump up my, my level of excitement excitement about the aquarium side here. So um, before we get to the, that stuff, though, I kind of like to get into who y'all are. So um, let's start off, Katie, mm -hmm. telling me your history, your, you know, did you know you loved animals when you were growing up? And like, how did you get to here mm -hmm. today? Yeah. So I did know when I was younger, um, when I was about like four or five, I was always carrying cats, always bringing in butterflies, turtles, you name it. I was, you know, always geared towards animals and very fortunate that I grew up in a family where my parents loved zoos and crimes as well. And we were situated actually in Northeast Ohio. 
So we were up between the Cleveland Zoo, the Akron Zoo, the Columbus. We had so much around us. And, and by that time, SeaWorld was still up in Ohio. We would we had oh, season wow. passes. Yeah. Wow. I remember going to SeaWorld up in Ohio, that old. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... So I grew up in Northeast Ohio and I went to Kent State University and got a bachelor's in zoology. Um, And I went to Kent State just because my mom worked there. So I was fortunate enough to get through that. Uh, I had the choice to go to a coastal like uh, university, but I chose to get kind of more a broad spectrum because I had no idea I wanted aquatics. My top three at the time were um, raptors, uh, big cats, and I want to say the third one was canines. Yeah. Ah! Yeah, it was the nowhere. That you're getting right now is yes. no air breather lover. I, okay, <laughs> yeah, um, and like the fourth running up was marine mammal trainer because you know every little girl wants to be a dolphin trainer when you grow up. So it wasn't until I was in my like junior year of college that I got an internship at the Greater Cleveland Aquarium, um, and I instantly fell in love with it. I loved everything about the job. It was super chemistry-based. It was super exciting. Um, and so I just – I felt like this was exactly where I needed to be. So from there, I kind of did a 180 because I actually was looking into going into um, behavioral neural endocrinology um, and doing a master's in that and potentially doing professor work there. Um, completely did a 180 back to I want to be – in an institution with an aquarium or a zoo. Um, And so from there, I ended up being right place, right time. I got a part-time position as an LSS tech, um, which is a life support systems technician. So that's who takes care of all of the pumps and all of the filtration that runs the aquarium exhibits. So we did that, um, and I did that for about two and a half years, and then I finally got my first full-time job out at North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island as a full-time aquarist. Worked there for about two years, realized it wasn't quite for me. I really enjoy seahorse propagation. I wanted to get back into cephalopods, you know, the uh, the octopus and um, cuttlefish. Um, and that facility didn't offer that for me. So I looked around and ended up finding Greensboro and they were like, Hey, we're looking for a seahorse aquarist and potentially doing cephalopods. And I was like, please me, that sounds like just right for me. So, and ever since October of 2021, I've been here. Nice. Very, very cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's quite the journey that you went on. I like that. (laughs) That's really cool. Um, how about you, Elizabeth? Um, so uh, just like Katie, I always wanted to work with animals. Like I, one of my earliest memories was, I think I was six years old and I tried to dissect a grasshopper on the front stoop. Um, so my mom knew that I was going to work something with animals, like a little kid. I wanted to be a vet or but, be a murderer. One or the yeah, other. You know, either either one. Yeah. I actually do a little bit of the both. Oh. Here. Um, but I just, I always knew I wanted to work with animals and, um, I ended up looking into vet school and turns out that's, that's not, that was not exactly what I wanted. Um, and I actually started my undergrad journey looking at being a field biologist or working in environmental education. Mm-hmm. Well, I tried that for a summer and that didn't exactly go as I had wanted it to. And I decided field biology was not for me. <laughs> uh, so I kind of leaned a little bit more into the environmental education, um, my undergraduate degree is in Virginia Tech from fisheries biology. So like I said, a little bit leaning more towards the field work aspect. There was, I didn't even take an aquaculture course there. Um, everything I learned about that was on the job here. But I, I then I, – I worked in environmental education for a little while and I'm like, and this is a lot of people. <laughs> and I was just not happy with working with the general public on a, you know, 24 seven basis. So then I actually had an internship here in 2018 in the aquatics department. And I was, I interned with the jellies aquarist and that was where I discovered jellies and like, okay, this is weird. A little bit of art, a little bit of science, a little bit of mess around and find out. And I'm like, Okay, okay, this is this is kind of what I want to do. So, like Katie, I actually also worked at the North Carolina Aquariums oh, um, wow. as a coverage aquarist, and we actually met before this yes. hilarious story. We were just like a, in passing, like hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, we didn't realize it until after we've been working here for a little while. Yep. But then, um, when after working on the coast, my husband got a job in Durham, and I'm like, uh, well, why not apply to the side center? So I did. I've been here ever since September 2020. Okay, very cool. I know that Becca loves to point out that so many people that are working here uh, had internships here. So good job keeping that up. Um, <laughs> you know, that is a, that is a favorite repeated tale that we hear. So that's oh, very yeah. cool. Um, and uh, y'all find that. Um, 
you know, we're not exactly, I mean, there's not an ocean outside. I don't know if y'all knew that. Um, <laughs> there's a zoo, which is kind of cool, but uh, there, there's not, there's not an ocean outside. Um, is it, is it interesting being a bit of a, a landlocked aquarium? Absolutely. We make a lot of salt water. <laughs> uh, see, I don't find it strange just because I, as the life support system technician at Cleveland, we were also a landlocked facility. I've only known landlocked facilities, even though I worked on Roanoke Island, we were on the sound side. So we were miles away from salt water. So we still made salt water. Interesting. Even being a coastal okay. facility. So okay. it's like, same thing, gotcha. different day. One of, one of my favorite little factoids um, that I, I just know from this life is that um, in the Phoenix, Arizona mm -hmm. area, which is as landlocked as you can be, mm -hmm. there are three major aquariums that mm -hmm. you can get to within like 20 minutes of each other. I've, I've done interviews at all of them. They're all <laughs> wonderful people out there. But whoever decided that Phoenix area is where we need three huge aquariums, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like... People in the desert like to dream about an ocean. I mean, I guess, yeah. Maybe. It's, it's not like they <laughs> can I, go see them anywhere else. Yeah, if I was surrounded by that much rock, I think I would want to be in here. Near, near water too. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. And during the summer, it gets so hot, you need to do indoor stuff. So, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> um, and actually, so um, you had mentioned, Katie, that, that you worked at the uh, Cleveland Aquarium, mm -hmm. right? And is this the one that's in like the basement of the building kind of situation? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Did you know, just a fun little factoid, mm -hmm. that there was a big push a couple of years ago to create a very different Cleveland Aquarium before that happened and it was going to be like a multi-story like think national aquarium or something mm. like that you can no. do there's some interesting stuff online you can google this if you're if you're interested it is I will have to an incredible mm. story it's one of those things that just makes you shake your head and wonder what could have been yes but then you might not be here so mm -hmm. who knows fair you know? fair yeah. I do know there was a lot of challenges at that facility um, being in a historical building mm -hmm. they retrofitted a lot of the tanks and it made great displays or like habitats from the front of house um, but it did not make great maintenance and or upkeep for the aquarists or life support techs that that makes sense yep it was yeah. a headache <laughs> I, I believe it i believe it yeah so um anyway moving on to the work that is done here um i i wanted to focus on a couple of different things and we mm -hmm. keep saying the word propagation mm -hmm. so let's start off talking about the different things that we propagate here what that means why we're using the term propagation instead of breeding just kind of you, you guys talk you want to start off? I was going to say, to me, like, the difference between propagation and breeding, like, to me, breeding sounds like you were trying to select for certain traits mm. versus propagating as I'm just trying to make more of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a lot of Fair. them. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm not breeding jellies to have, I'm not breeding my moon jellies to have six stomachs instead of four. I'm propagating them, and occasionally I get six stomach weirdos. No, 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 no. <laughs> those are the stars. Those are my special jellies. Yes, <laughs> yes. I have, I have two that are going to be on exhibit. So, so. Ooh, yeah. that's usually, cool. usually they don't make it to exhibit quality, but yeah, I've got two. <laughs> so let's talk quality. about the jellies, and let's talk about some of the the weirdness, like <laughs> just because there's Everything. so much weirdness. I, I, so I was just back in the propagation lab, and it's very cool. And um, I'm, I am I learned so much, and so I just kind of want to hear what it's like, what the life cycles are, how you propagate them, um, all of that stuff. So jellyfish have a really weird kind of almost two-phase life cycle. So what we know as a jellyfish, they reproduce sexually, but they also have an asexual phase of reproduction as well. So what we know as a jellyfish would be termed – termed as medusa and so those medusas there actually are males and females there's no way to tell the difference aside from under a microscope but the males and females when the environmental cues are correct and that's different for every species some of the times it's seasonality some of them might even be lunar some of them are uh, temperature dependent salinity dependent all kinds of things but when the conditions are right they're going to release their gametes in the water and then their gametes are going to combine in the water to create what's called a planular larvae and now my boss calls them little tiny tic tacs because that's kind of what they look like <laughs> under a microscope <laughs> tiny tic tacs but the planula will then settle out on a hard surface and actually plastic does seem to be favored for jellies <laughs> yeah well but there's also all the plastic pollution in the ocean too wow that is weirdly convenient yeah i know all right. it's not, not great <laughs> no not great but yeah. like i mean no I, I honestly though like to pause for a second like i really do love stories when you hear about you know the animal
animals that are adapting to us ruining the world. Like octopus will like, you know, use the plastic under there to like hide and stuff and build houses and decorate and like mm-hmm. it's a really sad story, but it's a really cool angle on the sad story, yeah. you know? Jellies jellies love docks. <laughs> okay. um, so then what settles out, the planula then settles out and becomes what we call um, a polyp. And so it's polyp just like we would use with coral. But it is a, for lack of better terms, it looks like a tiny little anemone. Uh, and they are very, very small. You're not going to go out to your local dock and probably find any um, polyps. So then that polyp it can stay for a long, 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 like years and years and years. Um, and that polyp doesn't will not produce more Medusa until environmental cues again are right. Specifically for our population, I just adjust the temperature and they're like, ah, it's time to propagate. Um, (laughs) So then when specifically for our population, I'll lower the temperature for about a month. And then they're like, hey, it's springtime, time to pop out babies. So then the um, polyp will kind of create these like little little pancake, they almost look like little pancake stacks um, of ephyra. And then those ephyra, which are, they're all, so multiple ephyra will pop off one polyp and they are all genetic clones of that polyp. So then those ephyra, they kind of look like these weird like little hand things. We call them um, umbrellas. Yeah, look, yeah, they look like little sassy umbrellas. Because <laughs> um, they have the little ribbings. It's an, they, it's an they, umbrella. Well, it's the umbrella that's got blown out by the wind. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, makes that's a lot of sense. Yeah, because yeah. an umbrella's yeah. gotten blown out by the wind, but they just, they pulse around, and as they grow uh, and get the umbrella sh- shape of the jelly, then that's when we would call them in the Medusa stage. So, there's a fire. There's a fire. So, that's, that's what I produce literally thousands of, literally thousands. That's so much. Okay, so <laughs> that's, that. okay, so I, I, wow, so many thoughts, so many questions. I guess the first thing that I'm, I'm curious about is, so, like, you say that it takes environmental things. Mm-hmm. to to make this happen weird isn't that weird why why is it like that? like i have i can't think of many species that their reproduction is entirely environmentally based a lot of them are actually yeah and a lot we of just them. don't know it or we already replicate it in institutions and we are unaware of that and like, and still, there's just, there's stuff we don't know. There's species of jellies that we can't propagate yet. There's stuff that I mean, like I'm currently trying to propagate one species, and I'm just like, mm, kind of twiddling my thumbs trying to try different things and see what works. Mess around and find out. Like I said, mm-hmm. right. mess around and find yeah. out. with jellies. Um, but yeah, that's, wow. that's jelly propagation. That's and really nutshell, fascinating. Type. Um, and then you said they also can produce sexually once they're in yes. the Medusa stage. Yes, the Medusa stage will then produce sexually. So, so it's not, it's not so like weird. an earthworm where you can just like cut one in half and you get two jellies. They're right. actually not going to survive if you do that. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. But and, and jellies are weird creatures. They don't have things like brains and nerves and such, right? Legs. Like, they do like, have stomachs and gonads. The okay. Two important things. Good. <laughs> but yeah, no nerve nap. No, no, none of no. that. That's crazy. They can sense up from down, though. There is a sensory organ that when they can sense. When you told me up. that, I was like, "No way!" Yeah. That's why they send jellyfish into space to see whether that see whether that sensory organ would, you know, turn what? upside down. It, it didn't. Spoiler alert: It didn't work. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting paper. They sent um, moon jellies into space. They had them strobilate in space, and then they were just wanted to see whether the jellies that were born in space could tell up right from right from up, and they couldn't. Wow. Yeah. That's that I feel like I mean I feel like I often talk about the fact that like you know there are so many things in the ocean that we don't really know and understand just because we haven't really explored the ocean um very often and when we do sometimes the subs don't make it back. So um <laughs> cough cough. Anyway, um but so um I just find it so interesting. Like, jellies are something that everybody knows about. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, everybody has the, the friend who thinks that you should pee on a, on a jelly sting, which is not true, by the way. And we all know this. <laughs> but um, but I think that was just made up as an excuse for people to pee on their friends. But, um, you know, whatever. But <laughs> yeah. But um, I just – I think it's so fascinating how weird and alien these these creatures that we all know Oh yeah, I'm like an I'm I'm like an alien keeper, like yeah. really. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and so you say you know that you mess around and find out, mm-hmm. and so I assume that means that a lot of the times it doesn't go well. And like, what happens in those situations? Are these just an animal that we need to think of differently than like, say, you know, a, a bear, where like 
I do conceptualize them a little bit differently. So I, I'm a horticulturist by hobby as well. And I kind of think of them a little bit like some of the plants that I propagate. And sometimes when you are trying to breed for specific things instead of just propagating, you're really like, well, this guy's not going to survive super well. So I'm just going to go ahead and take you out of the genetic pool. And so I, I kind of do that with my jellies as well. Like sometimes I recognize that this is an animal that is not going to have a good quality of life. It's not, it's not going to be a jelly. So then we do end up euthanizing or better yet, I end up feeding them to other jellies. Serve a higher purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. And so many, um, you know, so many facilities talk about the fact that you wouldn't do like a, a, a feeding of, of you know, a, again, if, if an animal, you know, an ambassador rabbit passes, you're not going to feed it to a bear. No. But um, it's, it's again, it's a different way of looking at it <laughs> with the jellies. And that's really fascinating to me. Um, that's that's very cool. And so um, what different species do you have here? So we have three species of jellies. So we have our typical moon jellies, and ours are actually a tropical um, moon. They are Hawaiian moons. Um, so, yeah, they stay a nice balmy 75, much easier to work on. We have our upside-down jellies, which are my photosynthetic guys that like to live life upside down. Uh, they're supposed to be on the ground. Uh, and then we also have our my, – my project in work is our um, – Atlantic bay nettles. So those guys are a brackish species, and they're the ones that hurt. Um, so I try not to I try not to be to be touched by the stingy spaghetti. Have Have you been stung? Oh yes. Oof. Vinegar. 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 Is, yep. Okay. So. I I've locked out. <laughs> I'm her coverage partner. Yeah, so yeah we're, we're coverage partners, so we really do work with yeah. her. Yeah. When she's not here, I'm taking care of the jellies. Gotcha. And when I'm not here, she's taking care of the seahorses. So. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And um, how much, since we're learning about these these things as we go, kind of, and figuring it out, how, how much um, of your work is stuff that needs to be shared? And are there, because I know there are other places that propagate jellies. Is this like a big collaborative thing or is this just like you in a lab playing mad scientist? <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> but there, there's quite a bit of collaboration. Um, there are like specific conferences for jelly keepers. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah that oh, yeah. is the nerdiest thing I've ever heard and I host this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, it, well the, the one that's coming up this year is called Jelly Camp. And my, <laughs> my, when I told my husband that, he was just like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> When I get my North Carolina license plate, it's probably going to say a fire or something silly. Oh my like god, that. yes, please do that. Because I already saw someone that had the Rotifers license plate, so that's already <laughs> what? Taken. Yes, I didn't tell you that. You guys are such dorks. I love oh, yeah. this so oh, yeah. much. That's oh, awesome. Is there anything else that you want to say about jelly propagation before we move on to the seahorses? It's fun. <laughs> All right. And that is a great way to Sorry. end that. Part. No, that's actually perfect. I just always like to check in, but that's, yeah. no, that's great. I mean, I think we, I mean, we just spent like 15 minutes on jelly propagation. Like, I think that <laughs> is on. a really good, <laughs> it, it, no, it's really we'll spend fascinating. spend that much on seahorses too, don't worry. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about this. So let's talk about the seahorses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, same thing. Tell me about how the propagation goes. Tell me the <laughs> interesting facts. Do you call the juvenile sea ponies? Just many questions. So the juveniles aren't called sea ponies. Ponies, they're all called sea ponies. Oh. Or I just reference them as ponies because mm -hmm. I will be like, hey, Elizabeth, can you go do my PM pony feed? Because Make I have friends. to go do X, Y, and Z instead. Wrangle um, the ponies. Yes, wrangle the ponies. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but for our, our species that we have um, on uh, site is our hippocampus uh, abdominalis, which is our pot bellies or also known as the big belly seahorse. So they are the largest species in the world. Um, and they are part of an SSP, which is a species survival plan. So what that is, is we have this organization that's called AZA. Oh, trust me. Everyone here knows what an SSP is. Perfect. Thank you. But I'm just going to let yes. you like, Perfect. we've been there. We've had coordinators on. We're, we're good. We're awesome. Good. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Good. Always like to no, double check. Yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they are one of the two seahorse species as an SSP. So um, we did have the other species um, in our facility. However, we found out that we, for some odd reason, couldn't keep them here. They just weren't working out. We were running into so many issues. So we decided to focus in on the um, pot bellies. Okay. And so currently I actually have three batches of fry. They're all about two to three weeks apart from each other. Um, and so the baby seahorses all are called fry, kind of like uh, any kind of baby fish. They're called fry. Um, oh, and that, so, that's a really weird name to the term fish fry. Yes. I actually never knew that. That's yes. interesting. Oh, <laughs> yes. Strange, yeah. <laughs> um, and so for our pot bellies, they actually are cued in by environmental cues. Um, however, they don't, I guess, 
I guess they already get it, but I don't quite know how they do it. So they actually do bre- er, courtship dancing in relation to the lunar cycle. Okay. So my males will actually typically give birth on uh, full moon days. So it's about every 28 days when a male gets pregnant, 28 days later, he's going to go ahead and pop out those fries. So as luck would happen, it's usually when I'm covering. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been happening on Sundays and Mondays. <laughs> That's so funny. But, yes. um, can, I mean, you just said something, and I'm guessing most people listening know this, but you just said males get pregnant. Yes. So that's interesting. Yes. Um, and can you talk about that? And do we know Absolutely. why that is or anything? So it's just kind of one of those things that they evolved. Mm-hmm. Um, they also evolved without a stomach or a spleen. Um, don't ask me why. That's just evolution went down that route and it somehow works out. So I guess it's not really a pot belly then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're actually named pot bellies because their pouches are so big. Right, no, that yeah, makes sense. yeah. Yeah. But um so yeah, our males are the ones that actually carry the eggs and actually give birth. Um so they it's confusing because it's not actual like live birth as a mammal would give, but it is live birth in the sense of a fish. So when the male expels the baby seahorses out of his pouch, they are live. So they are kind of live born in that sense, but they are deposited into his pouch as eggs so it's kind of very similar to like a sand tiger shark okay where they will live within dad and then pop out kind of thing so um, are the i'm sorry are the eggs um what's what's the word i'm looking for uh, fertilized yes are the eggs fertilized before they go into the pouch no okay actually like he he, okay yes yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so So, no you're good so um Every seahorse species will have a courtship dance. And so the male and female, there are some species that are, you know, um, monogamous where they only pair up and they will pair up. Uh, Pot bellies are one of those. They're kind of polygamous. They will kind of pair with each other and just kind of cross between, uh, oh, you're like available to like deposit eggs into. I'll go with you this round kind of thing. But essentially the male and female, when the female chooses the male that she is going to court with, um, they will actually start spiraling around in the exhibit and they'll follow each other. And when they finally spiral up to the top, and that's typically why you need a larger um, habitat, you need a taller habitat because they need to be able to twirl around each other. And then at the very end of that twirl, the male will actually position right under the female and the female will deposit the eggs right into his pouch. He can actually open that pouch up. And as she is depositing those eggs, that's when they're getting fertilized. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, but yeah, so he is the one and that's all a part of the Signathid family. So the family of Signathidae is the families of seahorses, pipefish, sea dragons, pipe horses. So like all of those species and all those groups of animals, the males carry the young. So it's very special. Interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. Because I guess I've, I've always known that the males carry the young, and I've always yes. known about them having a pouch. And yes. I kind of just thought of it as like a marsupial thing. Yeah. But it's very different than yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> oh. Okay, cool. So talk about what goes into propagation. Yeah. So um, currently we have uh, 18 individuals in our habitat. Um, we have about four females, and the rest are males. So I got – that's what – 14 females or four, 14 males. 14 males and, yeah. yeah, I could do math. Um, <laughs> <laughs> These are scientists. Yes. Y'all. <laughs> so, um, and so what happens is the, you know, after the courtship dance and I get a lot of courtship behavior. Um, I usually it happens in the morning and every courtship dance doesn't result in a proper fertilization or deposit of the eggs. And so the males constantly want to dance with the females. And so it's kind of hard to see who actually got the successful transfer of eggs. And so what I'll have to do is I'll have to monitor the males um, so they can control the inflation and deflation of their pouch. That's kind of one of the ways they signal that they're ready for the courtship dance and then how they entice the female over. They'll actually take water into their pouch and inflate it super, super big. So when you see those photos of like the big seahorses with the pouches all puffed up, he's not actually pregnant. He's just being like, Hey, Hey, I'm ready to dance. Are you are? Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, but I'll notice that, you know, a couple weeks after I notice a bunch of courtship dancing, I'll notice one or two males aren't really inflating and deflating throughout the day. And so that's when I really keep an eye on them. And the pouches will expand a little bit, but it's not to the extent of the males that are displaying for the females. It won't get that super stretched look. So I'll just kind of look for a male that's like looking a little full, but not like overinflated. Um, And then I will let them give birth on it, um, their habitat. 
is I want to make sure that he is not stressed um, because the birth event is stressful for them. And so let him give birth in his habitat and then we'll collect the fry. Um, we're working on a fry collection right now to increase the survivability of the fry um, because right now what they're doing is I'm trying to get them out. Um, they'll float to the surface because that's what they're naturally supposed to do. They go straight up to the surface and they hang on to a bunch of kelp and seaweed. So I'll deploy some seaweed at the end of the night um, before I leave and when I think I have a pregnant male that's about ready to pop. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times they end up in our filtration sock. Um, and so usually I can get a good amount to survive out of the filter sock, but it is kind of an aggressive flow cascading into the sock. So all of them don't make it. So we're working on a collection bin to be able to kind of skim them at the top of their habitat. Um, so they don't hit the filter sock and then hopefully we'll have a much better survivability rate down the line. That's cool. And what is their survivability rate like in the wild? It's a uh, half to 1%. Ah, okay. Yes. So very, very is, small. This is a very small. So any percentage is really yes, promising. At this yes. Rate. Okay. Yes. So, um, between all three clutches, we have about 32 left. Um, and we had a couple half clutches or new dads. And so when a, a seahorse, a male seahorse gives his first clutch or his first birth event, um, typically you don't get a full, you know, 200 to 300, you get like 50. And a lot of them can be underdeveloped because they're still figuring it out. And so he still is too. And so I think two of the three clutches are definitely first time dads. And so we didn't get all very good survivability rate just because they were underdeveloped and we didn't get a lot to begin with. Right. No, that makes sense. That's, that's really interesting. It's so, you know, we talk about breeding on here so much yeah. because of SSPs and because your facility keeps having ridiculous animals like bentrongs and red pandas giving birth. <laughs> so, oh man, a pygmy hippo, you know, just, just one or two kind of cool things. Don't um, forget the ray. I, oh, the, the ray is very cute. Yes. The ray is very cute. Yes. Um, but I, I guess it's just so fascinating to me to hear like both of these worlds mm -hmm. And how it is still, you know, breeding will call it propagation for the reasons that you said. Yeah. But it's so different mm -hmm. than it. That is, that's really cool and really interesting. Um, yeah, typically yeah. on the aquatic side, it's viewed more as propagation because we're not necessarily mass producing, but the, that is the life plan for a lot of these fish. They mass produce, so a small amount of them will make it to adulthood. Whereas, you know, all of our terrestrials and mammals will produce single or smaller clutches of, you know, individuals. And so that is more, and that's where AZA and the SSPs can come in and be like, you, we recommend these two to breed. Right. Whereas with us, we do have recommendations for our seahorses, um, and it's more of like group rather than individual seahorses. Um, we actually had two two different genetic lines um, under our facility. Um, unfortunately, we just lost um, the ones that we originally got. They were about 10 years old, so like they were way past their lifespan, which was great. Right. Um, but we did lose the original genetics, and so now we've got a bunch of we don't know who's who kind of, and so we're kind of producing for our sake of being able to, you know, um, have them on their habitat and for the people and the public to be able to see them. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And what is the, um, the like lifespan? You know, so for the pot bellies, it's very interesting. We actually recently found out through some Zims, um, which is one of the databases that we use. Um, it found out that the males usually have about a five year, um, lifespan, but the females can actually last up to 10 years. So it was really interesting to find that out because we always thought it was five years across. Right. And now we're like, wait, the females actually get bigger and can live longer. Wow. Mm -hmm. How old was Tina when she passed? I think she was eight or nine. Mm. I think she was right around her her mm. time. Tina, <laughs> Tina was our biggest and she had the best little Siri. So. She was she was gorgeous. She was she was a doll. <laughs> nice. That's so cool. And you know, that kind of brings me to an interesting question, which is with with both of these, I'm guessing more with the seahorses, <laughs> especially given the lack of brain of the, the jellies. But is there such a thing as a the personality? Is, yes, know, there a hundred percent is. Um you have to look closely and you have to, you know, watch them. Throughout their lifespan, um, but we actually had a male recently as well who had a very special personality. Um, we nicknamed him Sparkles. Um, he was just the seahorse that wasn't quite a seahorse. He would kind of <laughs> oh, no. hitch incorrectly, lay at the bottom, but would eat just fine, was doing great. 
But he, he held also, onto his nose. I'm not too sure he was doing that great. And he would also put himself into a chokehold <laughs> because seahorses will grab anything with their tail oh, because buddy. that's their main, the way they survive. They have right. that prehensile tail. So, like, they'll grab onto their buddies. They'll grab onto themselves sometimes. And when you look at that and you're like, yeah, you wouldn't make it out in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> So. That's uh, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. That's that's very neat. I like that. Um, and then jellies. I'm assuming they just they don't. Again, no brain. I have favorites, but yeah, there's. <laughs> <laughs> you have favorites? You have yes, favorites? I like my six stomach ones. They're my weirdo. Oh, oh well, I mean, those are those are like the in, in some of the upside downs with the better zoanthelly. Oh, uh, the prettier things. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, fair. It really. Do- I mean, it's funny because you're right. It sounds a lot like horticulture when you talk about this. <laughs> it, I mean, like I said, that's how I conceptualize it. Yeah, that's no. how I explain it to my interns as well. Because I have had some that were like, oh, like, like it, they think about it like this, where you know, they really are. They they are very very similar to plants in terms of like they really will only vaguely react to their environment, just like plants will. Plants will move to you know capture sun, um, and yeah, so they're they just vaguely like, pulse around. Yeah, <laughs> I mean they do kind of pulse a little bit more if you poke them, but. <laughs> Good, good. Um, and I think I think this is actually I think this is really cool and really insightful. Like I said, because it is just such a different look at things. Um, and um, you know, yeah, I think that's a really cool different perspective. Because really, one thing that I have learned is is from doing this podcast that most animals are just dogs or cats. Mm-hmm. Like you can relate almost every animal that we talk about to a dog or a cat. Just you know, <laughs> you just you just can't with with jellies. That's really cool. So I wanted to talk to y'all about training. And really what I mean by that is Becca very specifically told me that y'all do some really fascinating training that I need to talk about. And I don't want to piss Becca off. So let's talk about the kind of training that y'all do. And and I'll start off by saying that I did get to, to witness a training session. Um, so let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have two large rays in our um, shark habitat that we actually actually pull off into our acclimation pool that is attached to um, the main exhibit. Um, And we do training sessions with each individual. So we do Rogue is our Southern Stingray and Surfer is our uh, Spotted Eagle Ray. They each kind of get trained for some of the similar reasons of making sure they get the proper diet, their proper uh, vitamins. If we need any oral medication, we can ensure they get that. Um, But for Rogue, it's more of a cognitive exercise. Um, For Surfer, it's more of a um, make sure he has uh, good access to a safe time eating. Um, just because we did have an unfortunate event of him during one of our shark feeds, he was actually um, hit in the crossfire. Um, and he does like to take his time chewing his food. So we want to make sure we have that safe space for him. So we will pull them in at different times of the day. So Rogue does her training session in the morning, um, whereas Surfer does his training session in the afternoon when we do shark feed. We pull him off right before and we do our training session while the sharks get fed. And so we have what five, six, something like that behaviors yeah, that we like ask the race or to do. So steady ones. Yeah. So um, we ask them to do different behaviors. Some of them are just fun cognitive behaviors for them, which is like circle. Um, we literally just ask them to spin in a circle for us right in front of our gate. Um, we also do an A to B where we'll actually send them to one of the other trainers. Um, We uh, do other things like follow, which we can actually guide them into a stretcher if we need to, or we guide them into our blue bin for their knockdowns or any sort of exams that we need to catch them up for. So it's more voluntary. We're asking them to do these certain things, and they happily oblige. And then we're able to take that stress out of the catch-up and the vet exam part, which is great because Surfer is a spooky boy. Yeah, no nets. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Also, it took me a second when you said catch up. You said catch up, and I was like, catch up? Like, like, <laughs> yeah, like I was words, really thrown, up. like, <laughs> I'm making a joke here. It took me a second. I was like, wait, what? I'm confused. But that makes sense. Um, so you mentioned that 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 um, Surfer spooks easily. Yes. And uh, it was it was Surfer's training that I got to see, surprising no one, because if I'm going to do something in the morning or afternoon, it's going to be the afternoon. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so uh, can you just talk a little bit? Um, so, Elizabeth, you were in the water yes. when, when I was there. And I noticed that your movements were very slow. 
and very deliberate. And I'm curious, like, how much of an impact you being in there has on Surfer, how he deals with that, and, like, how you have to adjust. Yes, so I know you didn't see the beginning, but we actually jump into the acclimation pool before we pull him in because we have found that if we jump in with him in there, he gets very, very, very spooked, very uncomfortable, fast movements. He's just – us as fish people, we know that this fish is uncomfortable. Uh, But, yes, I was moving very slowly and very deliberately. He tends to like to move slowly, so I kind of like to match his energy. I am slow. I am like the jellies. I am just chilling. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Rogue, on the other hand, you kind of have to – it's fast and furious with Rogue. Ooh, yes. um, but Surfer also does not like when we take our feet off the ground. So feet have to stay on the ground. So you just kind of shuffle around. Um, but, yeah, he, he, he tends to get very spooked with fast movements. And that may have something to do with his bites in years past. But, I mean, that's probably just also – who he is as an animal. He's just right. a chill dude. And like, there are times when we do intentional quicker movements just so he gets used to that. But a lot of times if he's really chewing or working on a piece of food, or if it's a brand new enrichment, we don't want to add additional. We don't want to harsh his mellow, man. Yeah. 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 That's fair. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's he's very just, fair. he's our surfer dude. <laughs> <laughs> he's our little golden retriever. I know. <laughs> that is, I mean, frankly, it's adorable. Yeah, um, yeah. And I feel like a lot of people, like, we talk about training a lot on the podcast, but, like, I don't feel like people think you can do it with an animal like a ray. So is it the same basic idea of, like, using approximations and, like, positive reinforcement and, like, all the stuff that we say when we talk about dogs or, you know, pandas or whatever. A- absolutely. Surfers, uh, so Surfer does have a bridge and it is literally just a clicker that you could go to PetSmart and get. Wow. And um, yeah, we, so when we click, we don't, we don't assume that he hears it the way norm- we normally hear it. We always want to make sure he's in contact with his target. So when we click, he essentially feels the, the, the little vibrations with his little snoot. And mm-hmm. he clearly understands that that means food is coming. Yes. He really does. Okay. Yeah. So each one of our rays has a separate target color and shape um, that is designed for them. And they, we were fortunate enough to inherit the team and they came pre-trained. Nice. Love that. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but so yeah, they have that positive association with that, um, their target. And then they each have a separate bridge. So um, I know you said that server has a clicker. Rogue actually has a mammal whistle. Oh, I know it sounds really weird. Interesting. She 100% can hear it because as soon as we blow that whistle, she is waiting for food. (laughs) She is our little sassy girl and will let us know if we're moving slow. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. I, I, you know, I wouldn't think that the two rays would be so wildly different. They are yin to yang. That's really cool. Rogue is a feral cat. Surfer is a golden retriever. I like it. I like it. A feral tortoise shell because she's got the tortitude. She's a tortie, yeah. Yes. <laughs> she got the tortitude. <laughs> now, I'm curious. Um, I know they're different species. Yes. Is this like a, you know, is it a species thing or is it a true like just individual animal thing? It's the individual animal thing um, because I've seen and have worked with uh, Southerns at other facilities and they don't near have the amount of sass that Rogue does. <laughs> so wow. it's, it's very, it's her personality. She's also kind of picky, too. Like, I've heard of other Southerns that'll just eat anything. She's like, no, it's too crunchy for me. Yeah, she's our special child because rays are designed to crush crustaceans in the wild. They would encounter, you know, shrimp, clams, mussels, bivalves, crabs. That is their bread and butter. That is what majority of their diet should be. Um, We offer Rogue that as enrichment now because she will not eat clams, mussels, Jonah crab. Like, just won't eat it. She just... Flies right over it and ignores it. Wow. And we're like, okay. So what does she eat? So she actually gets the same diet as the sharks. Um, We kind of do a large food pull for the aquarium. Um, And so we get a rotation of squid, capelin, herring, bonito, salmon, mahi, Yeah, We get shrimp. I feel like there's one other I'm missing that's big. Blue runner. That's the other one. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Big mix. Okay. <laughs> she really does like to chew on heads of things, though, which is funny. Yes. She oh. likes the heads, but she won't eat. Yeah. Maybe it's an. It's not enough meat in the clamps. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe hard. she. Maybe she just likes chewing on heads. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. That is a sassy behavior. <laughs> yeah, Rogue is also one that we don't like. We can put our fingers in surfers' mouths. I would not put my fingers anywhere near Rogue's mouth. Your yeah, finger would come off. She's definitely gotten scraped us a couple times yeah. i've gotten a little nick from her um just 
trying to feed her and she nailed my hand and I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was, it was just a small scratch. Kind of like yeah. if I fell down, you know, on the sidewalk. Yeah, Honestly, happens. I've done yeah. worse to myself gardening. So yes, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really fascinating that they're so different. Mm-hmm. And I feel like when people think about rays, uh, just visually, they're, they're thinking more about what like Rogue looks like. Like mm-hmm. the Southern Stingray is mm-hmm. kind of the average thought. So can you all describe Surfer and especially a very important and boopable uh, part of his anatomy? <laughs> so Surfer, if you, I'm sure a lot of people know what Kaunos look like because those are, when I hear of a Stingray, immediately I always think of Kaunos rays, even though it's different habitat really because they are mm-hmm. more a pelagic species than your typical benthic species. Um, but he looks kind of like a cow nose, but instead of that nice lobe rounded front, he's got a nice pointed snout. Um, and it's really actually fun. I don't know if you catch or caught that in the training, but he will actually flex his nose yes. and he's got lots of sensory um, inputs there. And so you can kind of, it's very squishy and you can kind of just give him a little snoot boops and he enjoys it. I have kissed it, that snoot before, so. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> that is really cool and really special. Um, and so are there are there other animals that, that you all train that maybe people would be a little surprised by? Yes. So um, particularly under my gallery, I do train a peacock wolf peel. Her name is Allie. Um, she is target trained. Um, wow. Right now she's denning up right uh, during this time of the year. So I haven't gotten her to pull her out of her den. But during the time that she's not denning up, she's very food motivated. And so it was just one of those things. Again, I inherited the um, habitat that she was in and she came pre-trained, but she associates very well food with her target. Okay. And um, yeah, I don't think you think about eels as another one that you train a lot. That's pretty cool. Um, Why is she denning? So she is um, about seven years old, um, and so that's when they reach that sexual maturity. And the wolf eel is very much like any other typical eel. Even though she's not a true eel, she is actually a fish um, because she has pectoral fins. Okay. Um, That's the one main – there's other ways to differentiate between, but if you look like at a green moray, which we have two um, here as well, they don't have any sort of fins. It's literally just the long – yep, she's got two little fins. Um, But she's like any other eel where she has – she like to hide in rocks and stuff and during I find a few months out of the year she just won't come out of her den hmm. um, and so we're not super concerned about her losing weight because she's a chunky as it is <laughs> um, but also if she was really hungry she would come out of her den to right. eat that so so it's not like any type of hibernation or like no. baby type thing no, it's, it's, especially it's, at this place where you're dropping babies everywhere yeah um, it's it's just a thing it's like, more of it's more kind of baby related in the fact that like if she, if we did have a male um that she had access to she would probably end up mating and then that the denning up behavior would be her guarding her pups right um for a uh, period of time and then letting them off but um yeah she doesn't have access to a male so she kind of still goes through the motions of denning up for a few months out of the year and then coming out and being like hey i'm ready to train are you i'm hungry yes <laughs> wow that's really different okay very cool are you able to train the other eels the mores yes yeah, so the mores are actually trained as well they are target trained um most of our training is target training um the exception is our rays um in the aquarium and our penguins and otters i believe mm-hmm. are not target trained really um we're i mean they're working on getting the eels to like willingly go in a net kind of thing as well I, Are they still looking to get them in the tubes? I believe believe that is still. So one of the common ways to feed moray eels is to have them go in a large tube. So then you just drop the food down. Uh, It's typically a large clear tube. I've seen it done with smaller morays, but it helps prevent other animals from stealing their food. Mm -hmm. Prickles. Um, He's our pufferfish. Yeah, he's our pufferfish. Uh, He's actually, he's he's trained as well. How did I know as soon as you said prickles (laughs) that it was the pufferfish? I just instantly knew that. It's always the pufferfish. It's always the puffer. (laughs) Or the trigger. It's the puffer or the trigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our technically Prickles is trained. He does have a target and a, a clicker as well mm-hmm. that is designed for him. Um, when we had our Kaunos in our shark habitat, they also were trained to eat out of a basket. Um, however, we have moved them out of our shark habitat um, and into our touch pool just because they live better lives over there. Better welfare. Better yes. welfare. Yes. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I always find it, it so fascinating that like – 
sharks are just in mixed species exhibits mm-hmm. a lot. And I, I, I've come to understand it from talking and doing interviews. Um, I am aware of the fact that, um, you know, as long as they're well fed, they're generally not going to hunt when they could have food delivered to them. Yep. But also, they're the sharks. Yep. Yeah. Instinct takes over. And yeah. so, you mm-hmm. know, if you got a sick or injured fish, they're just, they go. You're yep. like, nature's clean. I crew. can't do anything to prevent that. So. Have fun. It's enrichment. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, honestly, it makes like it's it's funny to me that I think a lot of the people who complain about that kind of stuff in in captivity are the same ones who complain that you're you know maybe not providing enough of a true wild environment, although good facilities, accredited facilities, do a great job of providing it. But Mm -hmm. it's kind of that weird thing, and it's it's where a lot of that argument starts to fall apart to me Mm -hmm. because it's where it just becomes oh no, you just want them to live in a fairy tale world. Yep, you want yeah. them out in the wild, which is beautiful and pristine, where nobody ever gets hurt and blah. No, no, no this just no. isn't how it works. And no. yeah, no. I, I love that. I, I feel like the aquarium side of things shows that a little bit more than zoos often do just because of situations like sharks existing. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, you don't have lions in a mixed species exhibit. Oh, as God, often. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have lion fish in a mixed exhibit. Yes. 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 Yeah, well done. Well done. <laughs> yes. Um, very cool. And so what? how much do you have to adapt training to the whole, like, water thing? Do you all go in? Do you scuba to train? Do you do it at the top of the tank? How does that work? So at our facility, um, we never want to associate a diver with food because <laughs> that, that leads to very bad things. <laughs> that was a dumb question in yes. retrospect. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> other facilities will do mm-hmm. training in water. So, or, okay. like, mm-hmm. when divers go in. It all depends on what is in the habitat right. and the uh, facility's approach to it um however because our you know our shark habitat does have two large sharks um and there's that's the apex predator in that um we don't we don't tempt fate we just don't so um all of our training is done either having um a diver in the act pool which isn't really a diver it's a trainer in a wetsuit um we're kind of, you know, waters at hip or waist high kind of thing. Um, or we I was going to say, depending on height. Because depending yeah, on height. I guess it's more, it was pretty yeah, high. Closer to the torso. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm five feet and the act pool is four feet. Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. Um, but, or we do it dry side where, you know, our aquarists are standing or sitting up on top of the gate or standing on top of our platform to access our habitat. Um, and we kind of do that. But a lot of the things that we use are a lot of visual. So we do verbal commands or verbal behavior requests, I should say, um, for the rays, but they're really the only one of, in the aquatic side that gets verbal. Okay. So our sharks that are station trained don't get any verbal commands mm-hmm. or behavior cues or anything like that. They literally have their station target dropped into the water. The sharks know when they come over to that, that's where they're going to get fed. Um, when it comes to, you know, prickles, whenever we do train him, he just gets that target. And when he comes over, he gets the click in the food. Um, Allie does have... I hear you. Ellie Target. Yeah, oh, she doesn't listen. No. <laughs> I try. Um, I was going to say, how many of the animals that don't get verbal cues still get verbal cues because you trainers? Them. All yeah. of them, yes, That's yes. Um, and <laughs> Ellie's is more of a call to session okay. than, a, than a verbal cue. Well, it's a cue to call to session, but it's not a behavior <clears throat> command <clears throat> ask <throat> thing. So <laughs> that's the technical term, y'all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's very cool. That's yeah. interesting. And then, um, are there any other animals that y'all do training with that might be fascinating? So, I guess another puffer. Um, oh, I used yeah, to be see, in yeah. charge of the Rainbow Reef enclosure, um, which is back in our expansion, and it's you know a typical Indo-Pacific habitat. Um, but we have a his name is Mylar. He's not a Mylar. He's a balloon fish. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> I started target training him um, because I wanted to – the goal – so we never really start training unless there's a goal in mind. Um, we don't just want to add more work um, if there's not a reason behind needing to train them. Um, some of it can be cognitive, but a lot of it is there's a goal. So for Mylar, I wanted him to be able to be targeted into a net. So if we have to catch him out. We could just target him in, net him out, and I don't have to go chasing him around his habitat. I didn't have to stress him out. He wouldn't, you know, inflate. I wanted to avoid all of that stress. So it was more of the target you, get you used to your target and your tongs. Okay, let's progressively step. So I got a 
kind of close to the net. And then he saw it and he was like, nope. <laughs> so it's a work a little in progress. Bit more work to do. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, that's um, what training is. It's all approximations, getting closer, figuring yep, that out. Yep. Like, yeah, that's, um, that's not a fail. It's just a step. It's a step. Yeah, it's definitely a step. Um, some people think that our octopus is trained. It's more of a desensitization. Yeah. Um, so every giant Pacific octopus that comes through our facility um, has the same weight basket um, because the weight basket kind of stays with their habitat. And so we always want them desensitized to that. So what I would do is, you know, we'd get a weight on our GPO um, and then like the next week I would actually deploy it as enrichment rather than using it as another weight weighing option. So we would typically try and get a weight at once a month, um, sometimes once every two weeks if we were going through a big growth spurt or a big drop in weight and we want to track that closely. So, but using it as enrichment um, and I would put food in it and I would put it in her um, habitat overnight, I wanted to make sure that it came out as a neutral object rather than a negative. Right. So I have to have that positive mixed in with the negative. Interesting. Mm. I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I would have guessed that there would be more training. So that's, they that's are interesting. So intelligent that there's not a lot of training. I guess it's more yeah. enrichment that you have because I know. Yeah. I mean, I've I've had the amazing experience of spending yes. time with some some different yes. octopus. And it's more play and yeah. enrichment than okay. training. I yeah. got you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're called a sessions. And so mm-hmm. like for the GPO, I will essentially I'll turn off the filtration. Um, so the habitat's nice and calm and I get a better look at the GPO in it. Um, but essentially the call to session is me just making a bunch of noise at the top of the habitat. And I will actually have a peanut butter jar, um, that I will pour water at the top. Um, and our previous GPO loved that Octavia loved being watered. And so as soon as she saw that, she would just come right up Aww. and just yeah. So, but yeah, so there's not much training there, but we do a lot of training with our penguins and our otters and our monkeys. Um, but that's typical because they're mm-hmm. terrestrial. Yeah, so. yeah. No, that makes sense. I just, yeah, I guess I just thought of like GPO was the first thing that came to my mind mm-hmm. when you said training, but you're right. Even, all of the things that I've gotten to do, you're, I have watered an octopus as well. Does mm-hmm. not make them grow. Um, <laughs> no, I, we used an actual watering can. Um, yeah, have one yeah, of those too. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, very cool. And we've like played with Legos and stuff. And you're right. None of that is training. Mm-mm. It's play. Mm-hmm. Which it's is play. Kind of fun. It's cognitive stimulation for them. Um, but yeah, there's no behaviors you can ask them to do because they're just eight arms. Right. And you're like, they're a lot. <laughs> no, High five. Like, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, hi. <"Hey." laughs> yeah. Very, very interesting. All right. Um, so uh, I have to ask before we, we roll on here. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for each of you, what is your, your favorite animal or, or species to work with? Individual species, whatever. <sighs> no, that's a hard question. So I'm going to say giant Pacific octopus. And I know there's not a whole lot of training in that. Um, oh, no, that's fine. I'm just saying in general. <laughs> no, just for yeah. whatever. I, trust me. I get it. I, they're amazing. Oh, yes. There's yeah. so much fun. Um, unfortunately, our current one is failure to thrive. Um, and we've done a lot of looking into it and kind of reaching out to other facilities. Um, but she's just not at the proper size to be going through senescence, even though she is senescing. Um, so we didn't really get a lot of, we didn't get to see her behavior shine. Um, and she was more of the, she just kind of had the personality of, Hey, I don't want to really interact with you. But our previous one, Octavia, I got about four or five months of great bonding with her and they're just so much fun. They can solve so many different puzzles. You can give them so much and they still want more. And you're just like, I always felt so bad when I had to like leave Octavia because I'd be interacting with her for an hour and I'm like, I have to go do other (laughs) things, hon. So I'd, you know, close the lid on top of her habitat and I just see suckers sticking to the lid and I'm like I'm yeah. sorry. It really does. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, so. really, I really get it. Um, Jupiter is is the one octopus. I've met a few, but that's the one that I really interacted with multiple times, played with, knew, yeah. knew, knew me. And um, yeah, it's it's tough. And the fact that their life cycles are so short yep. is insane. I was, I was back on tour when he started to enter into, you know, senescence and stuff and it was just it can just be heartbreaking. Sad. Yeah. Just bad. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, it's, we bonded so much. Yep. I'm also convinced that they would take over the world if and they that's, had a oh, longer yes. life cycle. I literally I wish they would. One of the <laughs> interns fair, actually fair. asked me why they had such a short lifespan, and I literally turned to her and I was like, it's because they're so intelligent that if they lived for 10, 20 years, 
they would be the dominant species on our planet because they're that intelligent. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I would welcome our new cephalopod overlords. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I feel like they might do a better job than you. I mean, She'll be forever. Doesn't take much. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and how about you, Elizabeth? Uh, I I really I honestly love propagating my jellies. I love working with the corals too. But honestly, it's probably Surfer. Um, nice. Yeah, he's he's just he's he's just he's such two. a sweet yeah. sweet he animal. Is. And I also actually did get to work with him when I was an intern too. Like I remember nice. doing target training with my mentor with Surfer. And then you know just like today, I was like I'm in the water with you again, bud. <laughs> like it's, it's it's pretty cool. That he's, is really he's, cool. He's a sweetheart. And, you know, we've talked about uh, Rogue and Surfer's personalities, but but let's talk about the baby before we, we head on out here. Oh, um, yes, I, I'm, I'm understanding that Kiwi has um, some slight personality as well. Say. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I've actually been covering Kiwi these past couple weekends um, while Josh, her main aquarist, um, has just been on his weekend. Um, and... Working with Rogue, I kind of know how her behavior is, and I've heard about Papaya's behavior um, from Josh and Bethany, who worked with her the most. Um, and she's more of the picky eater, um, kind of is very obstinate, whereas Rogue is very sassy. And somehow Kiwi's just the mess of two, even though Rogue is not even the same species. And I'm like, not even how the same did... type of water. No, <laughs> I'm like, how did we fit both these personalities into one? I will say the one good thing though is that Kiwi is very good about being caught up to be fed. She, she will like, yes. jump in it. Yeah, oh. she will jump in the net wow. to be brought up to her container to feed. And I'm just like, thank you. Excellent. Yes. That so she is, is really great cool. about that. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, and how about a conservation organization? Um, so, you know, talking about training, we do a bit of training with our penguins. Um, and one of the great, you know, conservation um, programs out there is Sandcot yes. because, you know, the African penguins, which is the species we have, um, is endangered and, you know, their habitat is being threatened and overfishing is causing, you know, a decline in their food source. Um, and San Cobb is just doing so many efforts to help with, you know, awareness and being able to help the natural populations kind of maintain, but also grow. So, yeah, San Cobb is great. It Absolutely. is great. Very cool. Um, and I know our institution just got accepted into the Florida Reef Track uh, Rescue Program. So we will be having that in our new ARC system that we are going to be building here soon. Um, and so we will be helping with the propagation of corals to be able to be restored out to the Florida Reef, um, which is awesome. Um, but I know they recently went diving uh, in the Keys to kind of figure out which essentially to do a dive program out there so we could get people down there helping with the front lines as well as helping on the behind the scenes things. So Rachel is our coral aquarist. Um, and I know she really enjoyed reef. Um, that was an awesome program they went down. Um, and so it was just so cool to see and hear the stories of them going out onto the reefs and helping clean off all the coral trees and helping looking at the planting sites and doing um, fish surveys as well. So like reef is always a great thing because they're helping to restore a habitat that's been wiped out and we're still, you know, years later, we're still trying to restore a small percentage of that. So yeah, that's a lot better than what I would have said. My mind my, my just went like blank. Like, I don't know. We restore coral. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. That was perfect. And then how about? It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Rossifari poop story. I mean, I feel like everyone thinks everything that I do is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> That's in your personal life. That's I at work. Say foul knobs. You can talk about that. <laughs> oh God, yeah, that is a smell unto there God. You go. Yeah. Okay. So what um, is this? Um, so, so knobs are the food that we feed jellies. Um, they are freshly hatched baby brine shrimp. They are incredibly dirty, and if you were to leave them like in a sealed container for twenty four hours, it is one of the foulest smells you will ever smell. Oh. It is. It's like. I don't. I like, can't even describe it. It's like estuary plus sewage <laughs> plus rotten eggs. Rotten oh. eggs. Oh yeah, it's bad. Ew. And it's even worse when you spill it on yourself. <laughs> yes. You, know, you yes. just go around all day smelling like it. Yes. But yeah, there is definitely a smell. I can smell when I when the napkins weren't cleaned out properly. I'm like, oh, yep, yep. <laughs> Got to get on the intern about that. <laughs> and then do you have a poop story? Poop story. 
So, I won't necessarily say a poop story. Poop story. But I will say when um, Octavia was in her prime, so that was our previous GPO, um, we she actually would get, was kind of sassy like Rogue. Um, and she would actually squirt at us. So, uh, we actually have a little placard, um, or a little whiteboard, um, back behind her habitat that literally says days since keeper has been squirted by GPO. (laughs) And there were many days where that was a zero. Um, and it was just like, we were going to pack up or like, you know, we were in the middle of interacting with her and she had one more shrimp left and she would just soak us and she'd be like, give me it. We're like, (laughs) sorry, my bad. <laughs> yeah, they actually have pretty good aim too. Like wow. she was yes. clearly aiming. Oh at yes. You. So they can actually control where their siphon expels, and so um, a lot of times they can control it out underneath their mantle, around their bell, and they can control what side. And so they are very accurate. They are so weird. They so are so, cool. so weird. <laughs> I, I'm constantly learning more about them, and I have like watched the films and read Soul of an Octopus and yes. hung out with them, and I'm still constantly learning. I did not know they could do that. That's oh so cool. yes, yes. Um, it's really fascinating because that's also one of the behaviors we actually watch for okay. more of like the defensive. It can be used as more of like, I think interpret as, Hey, I'm annoyed or Hey, mm-hmm. you know, like interact more. But, um, one of the things we do watch out is like if pumpkins in her den and I'm trying to feed her, if she starts expelling her siphon at me, I know I'm like, okay, we're done. You're done. I'm walking away. Kind right, of thing. So right. makes sense. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you both for this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. All right. So there you have it, folks. An awesome look at some of the cool stuff going on behind the scenes at the aquarium at the Greensboro Science Center. I'm so thankful to Elizabeth and Katie for uh, spending some time with me, showing me training sessions and kind of I really actually between my visit then and the next time I was at the aquarium, I, I think I've been behind the scenes at every possible place you can be behind the scenes with the animals now. Uh, All I have left to do at that aquarium is dive in with the sharks and such. And I will, I I, I basically, let's just face it, let's be honest, just in general, I should basically just get a job at the Greensboro Science Center because I'm there a lot and I love it. And I, I like doing all the things that you can do there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been really fun partnering up with these people. Now you may notice, even though her name was dropped today, Becca did not interrupt this interview. And I just want to let y'all know that is not because she has learned things like self-control. No, 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 no. That is merely because Becca was not there that day, was unable to be there to interrupt the interview. That, that might actually be why it, it went So, well, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But hey, don't forget, if you haven't yet, go and check out Science Unleashed, the podcast that Becca hosts at the Greensboro Science Center. I was the guest on episode five. So go listen to that one. Give them lots of listens and lots of love. You can find it wherever you're listening to this, including on their YouTube channel. So, all right, friends, uh, I'll be back here on Friday with Zoo News and next Tuesday with another interview episode. But until then... Remember, the word credits backwards is Steiner. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.